Adventurers, attention! Fall in for Adventure Parade! The Mutual Broadcasting System cordially invites all adventurers from 6 to 60 to join in its parade of the world's most famous stories. Stories of action, mystery, and adventure. And here is your host and storyteller, the leader of Adventure Parade, Roger Elliott. Thank you, George Hogan, and hello, adventurers. Today we continue with the third in our series of true animal adventure stories. You remember we're bringing you this series as a tribute to a wonderful organization. But for the sake of any new listeners, uh, George, will you carry on? Well, this is National Boy Scout Week. They're celebrating their 37th birthday. And the writer of the stories, Ernest Thompson Seton, was one of the founders of the Boy Scouts. As a matter of fact, Mr. Seton was chief scout for five years. Besides being a fine writer, too. It's a real pleasure to pay tribute to the Boy Scouts of America by bringing you his delightful animal stories. What's our story about today, Roger? Today's story is about a bear, the Cougar's Crick Bear, and his feud with the hero of the tale, a razor-backed hawk. And now for the third of Ernest Thompson Seton's true animal stories, the story of foam, a razor-backed hawk. <laughs> just an ordinary razor-backed hog in the woods of South Virginia. Long-legged and long-snouted, strong in shoulder, hard and tight in flanks, and equipped with sharp white tusks that were enough to inspire terror in any dog that dared to try her. She roamed in the glades by Plenty's farm during summer, and when winter food was scarce, she knew a half-hearted allegiance to the Plenty barnyard. There one morning, a brood of cowering, pink-nosed piglets crowded against her, looking suspiciously at the world outside. Among them was one staunch rollicker, who got his name because the sight of danger brought his bristles up so he chopped his little fox-like jaws till they foamed. And therefore he was named Foamy Chops, or Foam. <laughs> Now, Lizette Plenty had wandered one day to Cougar's Creek for June strawberries, and she kept going further on until she heard suddenly a loud sniff-sniff. The brushwood swayed, and out stepped a huge black bear. Poor Lizette was terror-stricken. She could neither move nor run. She simply stood and gazed, and so did the bear, snarling a little. Then the tall grass parted again, and the old razorback mother and her lively brood pushed up. The black monster dropped on all fours and charged the mother and her brood. The fierce war grunts of the mother might have struck terror into any but the bear, for the razorback had mighty jaws and sturdy legs. She had backed into a protecting bush, making only a head-on attack possible, and the bear growled menacingly as he walked this way and that, with the mother's champing jaws aimed however he went. Then he began a short charge and stopped. The mother made her mistake. She charged, ripped his arm and bit his paw. But he was on her, stunning her with a terrible blow and raking her sides. He gripped her in a fierce embrace that robbed her of fighting breath. And as they closed, Lizette turned and fled for home. Lizette flew to her father and told him what was happening at Cougar's Creek. They started out together with dog and gun. But turkey buzzards were sailing over the place as they drew near. They found the old razorback dead and her limp brood scattered along the creek bank. Lizette began to cry, but suddenly the dog broke into a tirade at something far under the bushes. And there, bravely facing him, stood a little red-headed piglet, chopping with his tiny jaws until the foam flew. Poor little foamy chops. He was so hungry, so forlorn, and his nose was so sore where the bear had scratched him. He didn't even know that Lizette was his friend, and he champed his little jaws defiantly when she put him in a box beside the kitchen stove. She washed his wounded nose while he crouched in dull, motionless despair. Then she brought him a warm bottle and he could no more help sucking than any baby could. When the bottle was empty, he slept the long, sweet sleep he so much needed. Before his tail began to curl, Foam learned that Lizette meant food. Next, he found that he could bring Lizette, that is, food, if he squealed, and thenceforth his daily practice developed a mighty voice. And so he grew out of his box and into a runway and became so frisky that he was allowed to run free, 
Coming when Lizette whistled, racing across the garden or out of sheer caprice, hiding and watching her search for him. One day, Lizette was blacking her shoes with some wonderful polish that dried quite shiny. Homer tried in vain to get her attention. He'd tumbled a lamb on its side, he'd scared chickens, and run around Lizette. At last, he raised himself on both hind legs and put his front feet on the chair beside Lizette's foot, grunting as if to say, Please give me some. And so she painted his front feet with the blacking, which dried in a minute. And Foam's pale pink hoofs were made a splendid shining black. The operation had been pleasantly ticklesome, and Foam blinked his eyes but didn't move till it was over. Then he gravely smelled his right foot and his left foot and grunted again. Thereafter, whenever Lisette got out the brush and blacking, Foam was there to sniff the queer smell and offer his feet for treatment. There were two companions in Foam's life, a duck and a lamb, strange creatures that Foam inspected narrowly out of his white-rimmed eyes with distrust and a little jealousy. But they proved pleasant people to sleep with. They kept him so warm. And soon he devised ways of enjoying them as playthings. The lamb's tail was long and pullable, and the duck could be tossed over his shoulder by a well-timed group. Now, there are rogues among elephants, idlers among beavers, mangy man-eaters among tigers, and there are outlaws among bears, creatures at war with all the world, making themselves known by their evil deeds and finding pleasure in destruction. The Cougar's Creek Bear was one of these. He wandered about doing all the mischief he could, smashing down fences, little sheds, or field crops that he couldn't eat for the pleasure of destroying. But his main taste was for flesh. Calf's flesh he loved, but he wouldn't dream of facing a cow. He delighted in robbing birds' nests. He'd work half a day to get at a family of flying squirrels. But his favorite food was pork. A wonderfully keen nose had the cougar's bear. He wasn't far from Puppies when the soft breeze rippling through the dawn woods brought in the sweet, alluring smell of pig. And he followed it, swinging his black head as he sifted out the invisible trail from the others on the wind. Marvelously silent is the bear when going through the woods. And Cogar's bear reached the Puppies swiftly and noiselessly, led at last to the little paddock where Foam was sleeping with his head across the woolly back of the lamb. The bear surveyed the fence, and finding no opening, proceeded to climb over but it wasn't meant for such a hulk of flesh. The paling swayed, yielded, fell, and the bear was in the paddock. If Foam had been slower or the lamb had been quicker, everything would have been different. The bear rushed forward. Foam darted aside. The lamb sat still. A heavy blow from the bear's paw put an end to its ever moving again, just as Foam disappeared through the hole in the fence. The noise had roused the household. Plenty went out with his gun and dogs, with his zet whistling for Foam. They found the body of the lamb far back on the trace, but of Foam, there was no trace. Lizette's playmate was gone. The Razorback who had played round her like a puppy, a puppy who weighed 150 pounds. But he was really reviving the wild ways of his ancestors, long lost in sodden prison pens. Foam had gone back to the woods. It's a long, dusty road from Dan River Bridge to Mayo Valley by Cougar's Creek. Yet down its whole length, there trotted one day a sleek young razorback. She was barely full-grown, shaped in body and limbs like a deer, and clad in a close coat of glistening grizzly hair that flashed in the sun. Down the long pike she trotted, swinging her sensitive nose, cocking her ears this way and that, making a careful smell study of posts that edged her trail. She stopped at many a crossroad, and she studied many a breeze, but she kept on trotting until evening saw her in the woods that lie beyond the lower bridge of Cogar's Creek. She paused there at Foam's scratching post. And as she stood, Foam charged out of the woods, gold-red mane bristling. The gray razorback, Grizel, hadn't known until he stood there what had brought her along the trail. But she knew now that she'd found it. And so the woods around Cogar's Creek soon sounded with the eager talk and the busy hoofs of Grizel's brood. And the smallest, little Runty, failing to follow closely one day, fell to the Cogar's Creek bear, so that the bear took to following the family at a safe distance. It was on one such day that Foam heard a high-pitched squeal of terror in the bushes to one side, and his eyes turned green with rage. 
He lunged through the bushes. There, black and fierce, was a bear standing half out in the open. Foam faced him fiercely, and behind and beside Foam was a smaller razorback, Rizel. The others of the brood were hidden in the near thicket of alders. The bear strode in a circle toward them, but Foam swung round, so they stood and faced each other. There was just a little curl of snarl upon the scabby nose of the cougar crick bear. And the hog, high standing on his wide braced legs, made bigger by the standing mane on his crested back, his snout held low, his twinkling eyes alert, his great tusks gleaming, and his jaws going chop chop to a foam that gave him his baby name was flecked on the massive jaw. The bear made the charge, and foam darted out. Fuck, fuck, fuck with the huge paws, and deep short gasps of apathy. The blow staggered but didn't down foam, and his white knives flashed with upward slash the stroke that seeks the vitals. They reeled apart. The hog was bruised, but the bear had half a dozen bleeding rips. Again they closed, and the bear flung all his bulk on Foam, trying to throw him by his weight. But Foam was stout and rip-ripped to the soggy belly till the bear flinched, curled, and shrank in pain. Again they faced him close. The bear sprang on Foam's back, heaving down with all his might. Slash went those long, keen ivory knives, but Foam was going down. And then another struck the bear. Rizelle was on him with all her force. The bear lurched back. She seized his hinder paw and crunched. Foam heaved the monster from his back and turned and slashed and tore. So the bear went down at last with two light demons tearing, rending, carving. He clutched the standing branch, but they dragged him down and knived and heaved until the gull's screams died. All movement ceased, and the cougar's bear was a bloody, muddy mass. But Foam came quickly to himself and turned wholly calm. And the little pigs came out fearfully to root at the fallen foe, rushing away in fright at a fancied sign of life while Griselle came close to Foam and then called her brood away. They rollicked off together, Foam last of all, with strength unspent and head held high. So ends the third of our true adventure tales by Ernest Thompson Seton, famous naturalist, writer, and grand old man of the Boy Scouts of America. I keep wanting the stories to go on, Roger. You know, I'd like to know what uh, Foam does next. Well, I guess that's the best test of a good story, George. And you'll be just as interested in tomorrow's story, A Wolf Who Was a King. Lobo, King of the Karumpa. Until then, so long. So long, Roger. We'll all be listening tomorrow, same time, same station for another true story by Ernest Thompson Seton on Mutual's Adventure Parade. Roger Elliott leads the Adventure Parade at this same time over many of these Mutual stations every weekday afternoon, Monday through Friday. Be sure to listen for the world's most famous stories of action, mystery, and adventure on Adventure Parade. Roger Elliott is also your host at the House of Mystery, heard on most of these mutual stations each Sunday afternoon. Adventure Parade is produced and directed by Robert and Jessica Maxwell. Music is composed and played by John Garth. Ernest Thompson's teaching story for today is adapted for Adventure Parade by Anne Lorenz. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.